then you have to find some assumptions that everybody agrees that, yeah, it's got to be able to do more than that. And if you can prove it fails even on that, then you've proven that the system's not going to work. If you're trying to prove that a system will work, then what you do is need to re what you need to do is reach for assumptions that everybody agrees, yeah, that's really tougher than what we think it's ever going to need to do. And that's what Boeing did. Right? Boeing's test was, was um, designed to meet the FAA specification that the worst load that a wing has ever in history been recorded as having to take. Multiply that by 1.5, and that's what your test has to succeed at. Okay, so if your wing doesn't break until 1.6 times that, you probably paid too much for it. If your wing breaks at 1.4 times that, then it's not good enough. It's not, it's not good enough to go into, a, into an airplane design. So your test design depends on what you're trying to prove. So from that, I will also tell you that most people try to prove only that their systems will work. And it's just human nature. Nobody wants to have something that won't work. And so therefore, nobody is really going to be that eager to prove that the thing that they're inventing or building isn't going to work. It's just human nature. But the two of these combined really form something that's <coughs> bad. And by the way, that's why companies get partners to help them do stress tests. Because if you only do stress tests inside your own department, guess what? Everybody in your department hopes it's going to work. Everybody in your department is going to tend to design tests that will, quote, prove that it will work. It takes outsiders, you really don't give a crap if you hate them next week after they're gone, to come in and say, you know what, nobody's really looking at this thing, which I think is a huge risk. The third point is most tests, therefore, of systems that are destined to fail never prove it. I mean, how many of you have seen a failed system before? Even a little one. Right? Most of you. Was there ever a test in advance of that that said this isn't going to work? And sometimes even that happens. I got this body language. Yes. Even though we told them it wasn't going to work and proved to them it wasn't going to work, they still did. Right? Five times. <laughs> did you say five times? Five times. Oh, it buys time. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and, and, and it boils back to that big yellow slide I showed earlier. People don't want to know bad news. But if bad news is inevitably true, knowing it earlier is better. <coughs> anyway, I think that's, that's kind of an ominous ending. But fortunately, it's not the end, because I've got two whole minutes if you've got questions and answers. I'll put up my thank you slide, and then take questions and answers for a couple minutes if you have any. Yes? In your uh, slides, you were always talking about like one dimension. Um, yeah. Not, uh, you know, you have complicated systems have multiple dimensions that you might need to manipulate. So, how would you attack that? Let me go back to that. The question is, is great. The question is in your slides, you always talk about one dimension. But real systems have multiple dimensions, which makes them much more complicated. So, how do you deal with that? And I'll go back and, and give you a trip through memory lane. Actually, in the first example, I gave you three dimensions. And the problem with this slide is that it doesn't show the other 297 that really are. But this is an example of a multi-dimensional requirement specification. And the problem that I introduced later, and I talk about this in the paper if you go download it off the hotsauce.com website, is that when I get into the place where I'm talking about graphs, when I show the continuum here, I'm making believe that you can take a whole set of requirements, which may be 300 dimensional, and that you can sort of compress and encode it into a single number that fits on a, on a, a real number continuum line. Right? So this, this slide here is really more of kind of, this is what's in my brain conceptually as I'm thinking through these requirement dimensions. Like, hey, I've got network, I've got disk, I've got memory, I've got CPU, I've got thousands of other constraints that I have to test for. Um, and basically, your test ends up being a min-max function. Well, let me go to the example of the greeting card company. I told you that there were six sub-teams. Each had a separate domain. The networking team, the SAM team, the, the order entry experts, and three other teams, which I can't remember right now. That was a six-dimensional test. And within each test, there were multiple dimensions. For example, inside the network team, there were multiple dimensions as well. There was a throughput dimension. There was a latency dimension, at least. So it basically ends up being like a min-max type of a function. 
if any of the six teams come back, comes back and says, this can't be done, our component can't do this, then basically you've proven the whole system can't do it without doing something materially different about how that component's engaged in the project. So within one of those teams, if, for example, the disk I.O. team probably had constraints like, are there, is there a way to connect enough disks to the system that we can store all the data? There's a storage capacity constraint. There is a latency constraint. Is there any way that we can plug in enough disks so that we can have high enough um, throughput, which is the second constraint, at sufficiently low response time, which is a third constraint? And is there any way that a, that a disk farm with this many disks in it, with MTDFs of all the different devices being what they are, that this thing can stay available for the time that it needs to? That was team number four, by the way, the availability team. So basically, you walk down your list, and if any of the requirement dimensions fails, then it fails your whole subsystem. It can do it, but it'll be slow. Well, that's a fail. So the, the multi-dimensional thing, it's, it's absolutely reality. It's absolutely a complicating function. But um, you, you just have to break them down. And basically, if anything won't work, then that's a, you've got to fail the whole subsystem. Now, the point of this is, is as, as Gunther's presentation pointed out yesterday, is not to model that, oh, it's going to crash. See ya. The point is to model it's going to crash because of this. So let's see if we can't redesign this better so that it won't crash. Any more?